you turn to Hebrews 1 with me, all right? Hebrews 1. We kind of kicked off our study on Hebrews last week, but if you missed, never fear. We kind of just looked over the whole book from about 30,000 feet, and uh, this week we're going to kind of start digging in a little bit more. Uh, if you didn't get to see last week, if you're on Facebook, you can look that up. Danny posts our messages each week on Facebook where you can watch them, listen to them uh, on YouTube while you're in the car, if you've got Bluetooth or or while you're at home or wherever. If you don't have all that, we have it on DVD back there, and you can pick that up and watch it at home, okay? It's good to be with you guys today. Man, what a powerful music service. Thank you, Dan, and praise team, and Reagan for just lifting up the name of Jesus. And really, if you look at Hebrews, that's what this book is about, is about who Jesus really is. And sometimes we've heard that he's Emmanuel and King of Kings and Lord of Lords, He's our Savior, He's our Redeemer, He's our Master. We've heard those names maybe so often that maybe we've grown a little, a little cold to them or they just don't have the pizzazz that they once had. But guys, I'm telling you that to be able to say, serve the Son of God, who is God, who had no faults, who knows everything about us, what a privilege it is to serve God, amen? What a privilege it is to have Him as our Savior, the one true God of all time. And this morning, you know, as I said last week, this book was probably written somewhere around 65 A.D., just five years before the temple would be destroyed. And it was written really to the, the Hebrew Christians. And they were, really, they were really struggling, guys. They, you know, they had come through Judaism growing up, and they had done all the laws, and, and that was a good thing for the day. And that was kind of God's plan. It was God's plan for the Old Testament folks until Jesus would make his arrival. And so much of the Old Testament is pointing us toward Jesus coming. And we talked about foreshadowing and types and things that we've seen in the Old Testament last week, telling us that Jesus was coming. And, you know, they would bring their animals and sacrifice them and things like that each week or each year on uh, a regular basis. Had to go through the priest to, to all that stuff. And, and, but when Jesus came, that all kind of was done away with and the new was there. And it was in a powerful way. And this was God's son that he sent for us. And he was the perfect lamb of God. He would be the perfect sacrifice that would die on a cross and pay the price for your sin and my sin so that we wouldn't have to be judged someday if we do accept Jesus and accept what he did for us and accept him as our savior. Someday we won't stand before the Lord being judged. We will stand before him being redeemed through the blood of Christ. That's big stuff, guys. That's big stuff. And so he's thrown his mercy on us, and he, he loves mercy much better than he does judgment, and he's not willing that any should perish. These Hebrew Christians were struggling because they'd come up that way, and now Jesus had come, and there was, it was a new way. He, he fulfilled the law, but there was a new way, and, and it wasn't about the Old Testament as much now as it was about what Jesus had done, and the Old Testament's still important, don't get me wrong, but now Jesus, the Messiah, the one you've been praying for and hoping for for generations, was here. And he wanted to change your life. He wanted to take you out of that the bondage of law and keeping all the Ten Commandments and all those things and trying to be good enough to get to heaven. He wanted to change that where he'd paid the price once for all for you and all you had to do is accept his salvation. And you had salvation. You were made new. You were a new creation in Christ. But they were struggling, and some of them were thinking about going back to the old way. They didn't know about continuing to follow Christ because a lot of them had to give up family. A lot of them had to give up their jobs. A lot of them had been harassed on a daily basis and made fun of and ridiculed. Some had been tortured. Some had been thrown in jail. And some had been put to death because they had given their life to this, this carpenter's son from Nazareth, of all things. Do you not know what you're doing, the people would say? Why are, you, why are you chasing him? Wait here. Wait here. The Messiah's coming. And all along, they didn't know that he had been standing right in front of them. And they had missed what they had prayed for all those years. Because he didn't come the way they thought he ought to come. He didn't look the way they thought he ought to look. He wasn't from where they thought he should be from. And isn't it is amazing when we start putting God in our own box, he never quite measures up, does he? Because we don't measure up. Guys, let, let God do his thing, amen? Let Jesus do his thing. Don't try to put him in a box. 
And so they're confused, and so the letter comes down to them. And this is a letter, but it's different. Remember we said last week, we really don't know who wrote this book. A lot of us, uh, you know, kind of lean toward Paul. And if you look way, way back in the Old Testament, it was under the Paul uh, epistles, Pauline epistles, which was letters. And so, but it really doesn't claim who the writer is. Some say that they didn't say Paul because the people didn't like Paul because he'd kind of turned on them, and they didn't think they would really listen if they knew it was from Paul. But I don't know, as I said last week, it's almost like God himself wrote this letter and said, here, I want you to know about my son. It's kind of like you, you know, some of you grandparents, you know, if you get around some grandparents, especially if they had a new one, you don't have to ask them if they got pictures or not, all right? They're going to start flipping through the phone. Look at this one. Oh, didn't he look like me? He looks just like me, you know? And we love the pictures of our family. And this one, I start reading this first few chapters, our first few verses. It makes me think of Jesus, or God saying, let me show you my son. Let me, let me show you who he is. And man, he's amazing. He's amazing. I, as you can tell, I'm full of just excitement this morning of, of these great words. Look at me with Hebrews 1, and let's read down through Hebrews uh, 1 th through 3 in the verses there. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, listen to this now, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful words. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. That's a mouthful right there, folks. That is the God we serve, guys. We should be excited that we get to serve this God. We could be putting our hope and faith and trust in a dead God. Do you know how many people in the world today are putting their hope and faith and trust in a dead God? They're putting their hope and trust and faith that somebody's dead and never resurrected. And yes, Jesus did die on the cross, but on the third day, we know that he rose from the dead, and he's alive, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and guys, someday we're going to get to see him again. Or get to see him for the first time, some of us. And that's going to be exciting. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets. How did God speak in the Old Testament? Yes, he spoke through the prophets, you know, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Moses, Abraham. He also spoke through uh, angels. And we'll look at here in a minute. They kind of took that thing about angels and really kind of put their arms around it like angels are the greatest thing ever, you know. And they're great, but they're not God, and they're not Jesus. And you guys know we don't turn into angels when we go to heaven, right? Y'all understand that, okay? Because there's already angels, all right? We're something different than the angels. We get to sing the song of the redeemed. The angels don't get to sing that. Can you imagine that? We sing a song that even the angels can't sing because we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. It's going to be pretty one of these days. And yes, he's taking care of our loved ones. Don't get me wrong. But don't, don't worry about getting your wings, all right? It's, there's folks that already got their wings, okay? As a matter of fact, the angels are just spirits, okay? Now, they take on bodily form sometime to come and bring us a, a message, you know? Gabriel came and told us that Jesus was coming, things of that nature. So he spoke through angels. He spoke through prophets. He spoke through some weird things once in a while. Have you spoke to a burning bush lately? He did that. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He spoke to one. He spoke to Balaam through what? A donkey. That's a, that's a little bit different. Speaks to me through my wife. I didn't mean they're the same. I just mean they're, you know, I mean they're, they're different, you know. I shouldn't have went there, should I? I'm in trouble, Kyle. I'm in trouble. I just slipped out. I didn't mean that, baby. But anyway, he speaks through, he, listen, he, he has spoken to me through my wife many times when we decided to, you know, be a, be a pastor, you know. I was afraid she's going, do what? No, we're not going to do that. She said, if God called you to do that, we better do it. He spoke to her when I said, what do you think about children? And we come back from our quiet time there at camp, and she said, he's, he's laying it on her heart that we should do that. I said, yep, I think you're right. And many other times, he has spoken to me through her. And I appreciate you. I appreciate you. But he speaks in lots of different ways. Especially in the Old Testament, he spoke through lots of different ways. But guys, now, as we read here, read with me. Verse 2, 
But in these last days, what is the last days, Brother Todd? In the days of the Messiah, all right? Since Jesus come, we're in the, the days of the Messiah, the last days. He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things. Listen, if somebody tells you that they've got a brand new word and nobody's ever heard this and it's from God, you just turn around and run as fast as you can. If it's not from Jesus Christ, you don't need to hear it. Because in these last days, he speaks through us through Jesus Christ. Well, Brother Todd, he's not here. How can we hear Jesus Christ right here through these words? This is, this is, your, this is your sword. This is what God speaks to you through. He speaks to us now through Jesus Christ. All the old days in the Old Testament are great. And he told us, you know, through different ways that there's a Messiah coming, there's a Messiah coming, there's a Messiah coming. But now he speaks to us through God, his son. Let's get, look at these seven things that we find in this verse. Next screen, guys. Just real quick. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. But just in those three verses, this is what tells us about who Jesus is. God appointed his son to own everything. Did you know that? You know everything you have is not yours? Do you understand that? Remember, we're not owners. We're managers, okay? What he's given us, we're managers over. We don't own it. He's made us to be stewards. God created all that there is in space and time by his son. How do you know that? Let me read you this. It's not up there, guys. Let me just read this. 1 John 1, 1, okay? I mean, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, that's Jesus, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus was God. He was with God in the beginning, talking about creation, and before that, through him, all things were made, talking about Jesus, without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind, the light that shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Isn't that great? He was here from the beginning. He spoke this into existence. Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be the oceans, and let there be land, and let there be the animals, and let there be man, and let there be woman. And Jesus was right there all through him. The sun shines with God's light. Remember what we read over here in Hebrews one more time. It says, leave it up, guys. It says, uh, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. I told you last week, when you look up at the sun, it's hard to make out the difference between the sun rays and the sun itself. It's kind of like all big, big thing. And when you look at Jesus Christ, you cannot separate him from God. He is there. He shines the light of God. When you've seen him, he said, you've seen the Father. The sun shows us what God is like, his character. Think Think about Jesus when he was here for those 33 years. And think about those last three and a half years of his life and how he went about his business, how he loved people, how he took time for everybody, from the kids all the way up to the worst sinner, how he loved, how he didn't have a lot of stuff to himself. Think about his graciousness. Think about, you know, and there was a time that he got angry. He got angry and turned over some tables. And so we could see that little bit of God's wrath right there if we don't do what we're supposed to do and, and lead people away. I think the biggest thing that bothered him that day was they were leading people away from him. And guys, I'm telling you, you can do a lot of things, and God will kind of look over that and forgive you if you ask him. He died for that on the cross. But when you start leading people away from salvation, when you start living in such a way that people can't see God, you better be careful. That's big-time scary stuff there. Then the Son, Jesus, maintains all things. The Bible says he holds everything together. That's why we're still sitting here on this planet. You know if Jesus took his hand off, we'd just fly out into space. He holds it all together. The Son, uh, Jesus gave his life to make us clean from all sin. Right there, that's read in verse, uh, right there in the second part of 3 after he had provided purification for our sins. Jesus went to the cross. You've heard me say it many times, but you'll always hear me say this. Jesus Christ went to the cross, paid every sin that would ever be committed, that ever was committed, will be committed, is being committed. He paid the price for that sin. And everyone that asked him to forgive them and ask him for salvation, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will make you washed and make you clean and wash you white as snow. And then, the last one, the seven things of Jesus. Jesus, the Son, is now at God's right hand. Where's Jesus now, Brother Todd? Right here it tells us. After he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand 
of the majesty in heaven. And there's a lot to be said by that. Setting down means his work was finished on the cross. Remember what he cried from the cross? It is finished. When you sit down after a long day's work, it feels good, don't it? I'm done for the day. Now, a lot of us going, sitting there thinking, I've got to do it all again tomorrow, you know. That's why we like Friday so much, I think, you know. Got to do it all again, you know. But also a place of honor. No one else sat in that place but Jesus, God's son. And then also, I think, a place of almost equality because he is God. And we'll see God himself call his son God here in just a minute. So that's the seven things to show how great God's son Jesus is. And if you're saved this morning, that's who you serve. That's who saved you. That's a pretty big deal, isn't it? That's pretty good to know. That's the God that I'm worshiping. And that's good that he holds every. Guys, there's nothing going on that he's not over control of. He is sovereign. That's a big church word for he's over, he's over all. Now, there's some things going on that he's not pleased with. There's some evil going on in this world that he's not nothing about evil. But there comes a day when he's going to shut all that down. But right now, we must work in and around and through the sin of mankind so that others can come to know him as Savior. And that's why he tarries. Let's go on to verse 4 and 5. Verse 4 and 5. Jesus is the Son of God. Look here. So, after all that, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited his superior to theirs. You remember last week I told you you're going to hear the word better and superior and perfect a lot as we walk our way through Hebrews. He is better, he is perfect, he is supreme to everything that we would lift up any praise to. And guys, let me just tell us all this morning, let's don't lift up praise to anything but Jesus Christ and God our Father. When you go to worshiping anything and you go, well, I don't remember having a worship service, but again, I've told you this before, Anything you put before God becomes your idol, becomes your, your worship item, okay? And I'll say an item. But anything that put, you put above God becomes what you worship. And you can't, get, you can't get through doing that. It's very difficult. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he had inherited is superior to theirs. Verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I become your father. Or, again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And as you look down through these next several scriptures, the writer is quoting from the Old Testament. We're, we're quoting from Psalms. I've got the, 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 the verses right here. Psalms and Samuel are quoted from that, okay? So we move on down through here. We're going to see Deuteronomy and more Psalms, things of that nature. And so what he's doing since, remember his audience here is Christian Hebrews, and really our audience too today, he's telling them, look, I know that you kind of revere angels, and I know you kind of, you know, they really had a, a liking for angels because they had delivered a lot of big announcements, and a lot of, uh, one of them was when the, the law was handed down, there was angels everywhere, and so they just really, they just kind of lifted angels high. And guys, listen, angels were never meant to be worshipped. We've been studying through different books of the Bible, and every time, uh, I know, I remember like in Revelation, and John's looking at all this greatness in heaven, in heaven, and He's just overwhelmed, and, and he just drops to his knees and begins to worship the angel that's showing him this. He said, oh, don't, don't worship me. He said, I'm here to serve. You worship him, the Lamb of God. And so we should never want to worship an angel or, or lift them any higher. They are servants, and they are to serve. And it was a big deal to those folks. And, and, and God's just saying, look, through this writer, you've got to understand there's nothing bigger than my son. He said, have you ever heard me say, to an angel, look there in verse 5 again. For which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've become your father. He said, I've never said that to an angel. I've said it to Jesus. Or he said, maybe this, this quote, or I will be his father and he will be my son. He's never said that to an angel. And what he's trying to show the people here and show us this morning is there is nothing greater. He is, Jesus is greater. Greater than what, Brother Todd? Greater than everything greater than everything. And that's kind of the whole theme of Hebrews, I think. Move on down with me. Six. Now we see that Jesus is greater than the angels continued. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now, again, he's trying to convince the Hebrew Christians, look, you're trying to worship these angels, and, and 
look, look at the story. He said, back up a minute and look at the, look what happened when my son was born. The angels worshiped him and they declared his glory. And, you know, we'll, we'll do this in just a few months. We'll hear those verses. A multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. He said, you remember that? If, if angels were bigger than my son, if they were bigger than Jesus, then I wouldn't have them worship him. It makes sense. It's common sense, doesn't it? But you've got to remember that people are still struggling about this. You go, Brother Todd, I know all these things. Well, that's great. But there's a lot of people out there that we're around every day, guys, and they're worshiping all kinds of things. And a lot of them don't even believe Jesus is God's son. And so we, we kind of, as messengers, as ambassadors to Christ, for Christ, we have the job to go out there, just like this writer is doing here in Hebrews, and say, look, if you're worshiping anything but Jesus, the Son of God, and God himself, you're worshiping the wrong thing. You're wrong. And that's what this writer is telling the people there. It seems simple. It seems pretty straightforward if you've been in church for a while. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people out there that think Jesus was a good teacher. He, you know, they called him rabbi, so he's a good teacher. Maybe he was a prophet. Maybe, you know, yeah, he did a lot of great things. But you know what? I can't see him as the son of God. How, how come the Son of God would let somebody nail him to a cross? How come a, a Son of God, if he was really a Son of God, he wouldn't let him beat him to death. He would have just stood up and said, enough is enough. But when he came to this earth, guys, he humbled himself. And he took your place and my place. And he did something that we deserved. And he did it for us. What a, what a loving, merciful God that we serve. And again, when God brings his firstborn in the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he said, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God. Listen to this now. This is a quote from the Old Testament. We're in uh, Deuteronomy. And God is calling his son God. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So we know he's eternal. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. And what that's saying is you're going to be king. And you're going to have supreme authority. And you're going to rule with justice and in perfect harmony, just the way it's supposed to be done. And we know that. It will be a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. And I think that pertains to when he was here on this earth. They tempted him 40 days and 40 nights. He had many opportunities living amongst us to sin for sure. Uh, but he, he was being watched. He was being looked over. And he did everything perfect. He did everything just right. And he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. And he was proving himself to be fit to reign and be the king of this kingdom. Therefore, I'm second part of nine, your God, therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions. Now, companions in heaven would be maybe the angels of some kind, their friends, but I think also he set us above all of us here on earth because we are... We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are his companions, so to speak, in that realm. We get to heaven, of course, he is God, he is God's son. But he said, I'm setting him over all your companions. And then he adds this, which is beautiful, by anointing you with the oil of joy. I wonder what the oil of joy is. You think about that, and I think, I think he just anointed him with the Holy Spirit. You have... God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you see, you know, a lot of people don't really know if they believe in the Trinity or not. The Trinity is three gods in one, all right, three, three in one. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And you see them right here in this verse. O God, 
your God, that's Jesus, that's Father, and I anoint you with the, the joy of the, of the oil, oil of joy. And so we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, supreme and above all things. Let's go on to verse 10. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. Now, if you translate Lord in the Old Testament, that's Jehovah. So in the Old Testament, you're Jehovah. In the New Testament, he was Jesus. You see the, you see the place of authority that God is putting on his son? Who is God, which is hard to understand. But trusting by faith that God knows exactly what he's doing. And he puts him on this high plane. It's almost, it almost makes your head hurt trying to, to understand it all. But man, we serve a powerful God. You laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. I love that. We looked back at Job several weeks ago, and Job was all upset. And God, why am I going through this and all these things? And God says to Job, were you there when I laid out the foundations of the earth? Were you there when I put the water in its place and stretched the mountains where they're at? Were you there? And he's almost like saying, do you have a right to question me? And guys, I know that's kind of stern, you know. But, but we ought to think about that. When we question God and we, we wonder, why God this and why God, and it's, it's, it's common of us. We, we're all like that. We're always asking questions. Why God? Why would this happen? Why would this go through this? And, and why, 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 why? But it comes back to God wants us to put our faith in him 100%. And that's hard when we're hurt. When our family's hurt, when people are sick, when people are struggling, it's hard to put our whole faith and trust in those moments. But he said, look, I want you to trust me. If I can lay out the foundations of the earth, if I can put the mountains and the trees and the fish and the birds in the air in their place, don't you think I'm going to take care of you? Remember what he said, consider the lilies, you know? They don't toil. Instead of the lilies of the field, I take care of them. The sparrow, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. As he's going to take care of you. You believe that this morning? Y'all believe that? Amen? No, you don't believe it, do you? Do you believe he'll take care of you? Amen. He's proved himself over and over to take care of us. And I know it's hard sometimes. Then 11. They will perish. He's laid out all that. You, you look out there, guys, and if you travel across our United States of America, there are some beautiful sights. There are some beautiful sights. You travel around the world, beautiful sights. But, guys, this is so under God's hands that he's just going to fold this up and take it off like dirty clothes someday and put on some new. Look here, read with me. They will perish. All the stuff that we see today will perish. But you remain. Talking about Jesus, he's forever. He never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I love that consistency about our Savior. If he loves me yesterday, guess what? He's going to love me tomorrow. If he loves me tomorrow, he's going to love me today. If he loves me 10 weeks from now, he's going to love me 30 weeks from now. He never changes. You can't make him quit loving you. Stop doing it. You can't make him quit loving you. He will never stop. They will perish, but you will remain they will all wear out like a garment. Do you know someday our sun's going to wear out? Those beautiful stars at night, they're going to wear out. Those beautiful rocky mountains, they're going to wear out. You ever been to Hawaii? That's going to wear out. You go, really? It's, it's beautiful. According to this, it says they will wear out like a garment, and you will roll them up like a robe, and like a garment they'll be changed. Think about it. Think about the power that we have in the God, the power that God has, the one we serve. You know, when, you, when your clothes get dirty and smelly and they don't fit right anymore, you just get rid of them. But someday he's going to do that to all that we see. It's been tainted by sin. People have been hurt. People have been punished. People have been tortured. People have lost loved ones. People have lost... They fought diseases. They fought injuries. 
They fought each other in wars. We've seen people perish and, and people kill other people. And we've seen all this mess. And it's been, our world has been tainted by this sin. It's been, it's been diseased by this sin. And someday, Jesus Christ is just going to take it off and fold it up and throw it in the trash. He said, let me make you something brand new. And guys, I'm telling you, this is beautiful out here in this world, in this nature. Can you imagine when he creates something new, how awesome it's going to be? Think about a, think about a, 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 a mountainside just bathed in snow, like a blanket of snow, and hanging in the trees. And you go, man, that, that's beautiful. But someday Jesus is going to just fold that up and just create and lay out something. He says he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And I'm telling you, it's going to be something you want to see. You don't want to miss that. You don't want to miss that. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But he says one more time, but you, Jesus, you remain the same. And your years will never end. You realize that you're sitting here this morning serving a God. That will never end. That will never end. Well, let's finish up. To which of the angels, he says, he kind of goes back to this angel thing one more time, just, just in case you didn't get it, all right? To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make you, your enemies, a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? Now, a couple things there, real quick. Until I make your enemies a footstool. One of the things in the old days when you would win a war, win a battle, as a, as a symbol of your supremacy and your authority, they would walk up to the king of the other country or one of the important people, and they would put their foot on the neck of that person. And it showed like, you know, kind of like they do in wrestling. You know, you guys know wrestling, you know. They put their foot up on their chest, you know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm victorious. I won. But someday God says, I'm going to make all your enemies. Guys, think about how, in, how many enemies Jesus has nowadays. I mean, people are blasting him from every side. People don't want no part of this Jesus stuff. People don't want no part of church and, and God and salvation. And that's just a big bunch of fairy tale mess, and it's not worth anything. But guys, I believe it's everything. And I believe this word backs that up. And I believe the Holy Spirit shows us in our heart there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. And someday, guys, all those people that are speaking evil of Jesus... And those that spit on him on the cross and stuck a spear in his side and shoved thorns on his head. Those that whipped him over and over and over. They will sit at his feet and he, God will make them his footstool. He will reign supreme in all of authority. And he says this on the, on the angels there at the last. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those to serve who will inherit salvation. I know y'all like that thing about guardian angels. Right there is the closest thing I can find that we have a guardian angel. The angels are sent to, to serve, to minister to us. How many times have you been through something, you go, how in the world did I miss getting hurt? How did I miss not that getting a hold of me? Or, you know, how did I not get in that wreck? Where did that car come from? It's like you went through them. God says he sent his angels to minister to us. How many times have you been sitting up at late at night with a, a child? And you just, you prayed and prayed and you just wanted some relief for that baby. And peace comes. How do we know that wasn't an angel ministering through God to us? Beautiful thing. Ministering to those that know salvation. And guys, I believe maybe even the Holy Spirit is using angels to minister to those that don't know him yet. To bring them to salvation. Just a thought. But I think the Lord can work in that way. Through the Holy Spirit. Do that. But getting back to the main point here. As he said, look, they're going to minister to you. But they're not your God. 
and they're not the one to worship. Only Jesus Christ. And him alone will we worship. We serve a powerful God, amen? Isn't this some great verses? Guys, I'm telling you, this is, as I said last week, this is T-bone steak. Bring your A1 every week because we're going to have some good stuff through this. This is deep, but it is good to see. And God's just said, here, here's what my son looks like. Let me show you some pictures of my son. And guys, today, if you don't know him, it would be the best decision of your life to give your heart to Jesus. And let this one that holds everything in his hand hold your life in his hand also. For you that know him this morning, when we bow our head, would you thank him? Would you thank him for doing all this for you and caring for you so much? Because, guys, we seem so insignificant sometimes, and we tell ourselves that. But God thinks we're something great. He thought we were worth loving. He thought we were worth sending his only son to die for us. And I don't think I'm ever going to have enough time, even in glory, Thank you for that. Amen. Let's pray. And Father, you are great. You are mighty. You are powerful. And yet you love us like no one else has ever loved us. Lord, we're amazed as we look at who you are and what you've done and what you're doing and what you will do. We're amazed at how Nature is just at your beck and call. And how you can say, light, and there's light. Or you can say, that's enough, and it's over. Lord, we thank you for saving us. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the ministering spirits of the angels. But Lord, we also know that they're here to serve and not to worship. And Lord, they worship you just like we do. Lord, thank you for this letter this morning. I hope it speaks to us, maybe in a new, fresh way. Maybe we just hadn't thought about the greatness of God in a while. And I pray that it will just speak to our hearts. And we will just worship you more this week as we're going every day. Maybe one of these thoughts will come in our mind, and just we'll just stop and thank you for it as we read through the first chapter of Hebrews. Lord, speak to hearts this morning. Lord, if there's new folks here who'd like to join our family, we'd love to talk to them about that. There's people in this congregation that would love to come to know you as Savior. We'd love to help them with that. Maybe there's just some hurts. Maybe there's some prayers that's needed this morning. And Lord, we pray that they will take this opportunity to come and pray with someone. Lord, whatever, you just speak this morning. In your name we pray. Hey, thanks for joining us today. If you have prayer requests, need to contact us, or need directions to the church, check us out online at fbckaiser.com. If you want to join us, we're located at 210 East Main Street or give us a call at 870-526-2604 or send mail to P.O. Box 306, Kaiser, Arkansas, 72351. We'd love to see you soon. Thanks again for joining us and may God bless you.